based on this morning's docket. Case number 112556, Danny Beauclair v. State of Kansas. Council ready to proceed? May it please the court, Appellant Danny Beauclair appears by Jonathan Phelps. Good morning, Chief Justice. Uh, I reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Three minutes is granted. Thank you. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. This case arrives here as the latest of multiple attempts of Mr. Beauclair to withdraw his no contest pleas to rape and aggravated sodomy of his stepdaughter and to set aside his conviction on those no contest pleas arising from charges filed in 1999. He alleges ineffective assistance of trial counsel Gwen Harris related to the conflict of interest she had in representing Mr. Beauclair. And primarily in this appeal, he alleges that Gwen Harris at every stage of the representation of him had a conflict of interest, which he alleges prejudiced him which requires the court to at least remand the case to the trial court to hold a hearing on his claims concerning this conflict. <clears throat> he suggests today that upon remand by this court and hearing by the trial court that the conflict and the prejudice will be manifest and the adverse effects clearly shown requiring the, courts, the trial court's further action for relief. <clears throat> Mr. Beauclair has identified real adverse uh, effects from concurrent representation by Gwen Harris of Della Beauclair and Danny Beauclair in substantially related litigation. Most of these have been identified in the briefing. I hope to focus primarily on one today, which I believe is rather significant in light of the Court of Appeals decision. On about March 29th, 1999, Danny Bocalli's stepdaughter. We have a question. I'm sorry. Right here. Yes. Um, before we get into the merits on your uh, ineffective assistance or conflict claims, you have some procedural problems. Yes, you do. Uh, we've seen Mr. Beauclair several times um, in the courts uh, since his pleas. And so you have both a timeliness issue and a successive, uh, successive motion or petition problem. So I want to talk about how you get past those before we get to the merits? Uh, we suggest that it would be manifestly unjust for the court not to reach this argument, it not having been addressed previously, although raised by Mr. Beauclair, uh, that it is of such a degree in nature as to correct manifest injustice if you granted his petition. Uh, him being ignorant of the one-year requirement, <clears throat> didn't actually raise it until a pleading he filed um, on, it, on about the uh, fourth day of June 2013 and for the first time articulates facts but doesn't put it together as to what he's actually saying, my, my lawyer had a serious conflict of interest. Okay, so the only ground that you are um, advancing to avoid the procedural issue is the nature of the substantive claim. You're not, you're not trying to um, claim actual innocence in order oh, to... Oh, no, he's briefed actual innocence. Okay. Were he's... you not intending to argue that? <laughs> you well, haven't mentioned it yet. It seems like a, a big question here. I do intend to argue it. Okay. And it really goes to the heart of the argument because he has maintained his innocence uh, since he started filing these proceedings, has sworn to affidavits that he's actually innocent, has proffered um, affidavits from others to establish actual innocence. Including the victim, correct? Correct. Okay. 
And um, the reason that it's met with incredulousness by the Court of Appeals is that they say, well, you start confessing to the police before you claim a conflict uh, by your attorney. Uh, and the facts simply don't support that. In fact, he specifically alleged in his June 4th, 2013 filing, significant facts to show. And, and if I could go back to where I was on about March 29th, uh, his stepdaughter, March 29th of 1999, uh, Danny Beauclair's stepdaughter, the victim in the underlying criminal case, passed a note in school to a friend indicating that she had been having sexual relations with Danny Beauclair. An investigation ensued and immediately the stepdaughter and eventually two of her siblings were removed from the home of Mr. Bo Beauclair and his wife, Della Beauclair. That removal caused a child in need of care petition to be filed in Shawnee County District Court. On April 19, 1999, Gwen Harris was appointed by the Honorable Dan Mitchell to represent Della Beauclair in that petition for child in need of care. Before the Topeka Police Department detective, Ron Gish interviewed Danny Beauclair on April 27th, eight days later. Gwen Harris had consulted with Della Beauclair and Danny Beauclair and advised them, and in particular advised Danny Beauclair, that the only way to get their daughter back into their home and for Danny Beauclair to defend against criminal charges, which would be filed against him, would be for him to enter the district attorney's incest diversion program where there would be no direct penal consequences, both of which would require a confession, getting the kids back in the home and avoiding direct penal consequences. Mr. Phelps, yes. I need to redirect you. You just have limited time and I need to redirect you sure. to the actual innocence claim. Do you, um, what kind of standard do you need to meet in order to get, pat get an evidentiary hearing in district court on actual innocence? What, what do you have to demonstrate in order to use that as a gateway into your substantive claims about the performance of Ms. Harris? I have to show that it's um, a <coughs> credible, substantive claim of actual innocence. I have to what, what does that mean? Can you well, point us to any authority for what that really means? Not outside of what briefs have been submitted. I, ha I think the facts that I just was about to get to demonstrate clearly why it's authorized and why it's justified. Um, in these meetings with his attorney who had this conflict, he told him that it would require a confession, even though false, uh, from Danny Beauclair to the allegations of sexual abuse, including during the interview by the police, including on the day of the interview by the police, um, her advice, which he followed in order to get the diversion program and to get the children back in the home, you must say certain things, uh, including in falsely admitting that you committed this crime. Now that's the, 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 the key here, we submit, that the confession that they keep hitting him up the side of the head with uh, to the police actually was a, f a result of this uh, advice he received. So his confession is false. And he's provided an affidavit uh, from the alleged victim and immediate siblings in the household with her as to the falsity of the accusations. So at this point, who ha from whom has he obtained affidavits or uh, with the, the assistance The of two family? siblings that were in the home and the alleged victim and the mother of the child who he was married to at the time. It's my understanding of where those, and of course he submitted his own affidavit declaring uh, his innocence uh, and setting forth facts as to uh, why the allegations should be called into <coughs> questions. Now, he provides all these details uh, at, in the record, and it can be found at pages 23 to 27 in volume two of the Record on Appeal, his June 4th filing. And he specifically describes these circumstances I just uh, recited here, um, although he doesn't call it a conflict of interest by concurrent representation of Della Beauclair and himself. Della Beauclair had the interest uh, to have her children return to her home. That interest competed with Danny Beauclair's interest in that his liberty 
was at stake. Uh, we submit the Constitution's required effective assistance with counsel by receiving independent legal advice, especially when he's facing a level one felony charge. The foundation for effective assistance of counsel is that it must be conflict free. Uh, the, the rule requires if there's going to be concurrent representation in substantially related litigation, there must be a full informing of the client sign waivers of the conflict. There's no record of that. Didn't happen. Didn't happen before a trial judge. Didn't happen in her office. Didn't happen anywhere. In April of 1999, Gwen Harris properly had one client, Della Beauclair. Her interests were inherently in conflict with Danny Beauclair's. Eventually, her partner, Kelly Brown, took over the representation of Kelly Beauclair in the sink case. And that representation continued throughout the time Gwen Harris represented Danny Beauclair in the criminal case. I submit to you that this conflict excluded Gwen Harris from consulting with, with and advising Danny Beauclair to confess to a crime he did not commit in April of 99 before he was interviewed by Topeka De uh, Detective Gish and at all times thereafter. Mr. Beauclair has alleged uh, that, that he confessed to a crime he did not commit because Gwen Harris advised him to it repeatedly. He had had no prior contact with the criminal justice system in April of 1999. Gwen Harris had recently left the Shawnee County District Attorney's Office. One of her duties included prosecuting sex offenses. She presumably was thoroughly familiar with this incest diversion program. On May 6, 1999, while still representing um, uh, Mr. Beauclair's wife, Della Beauclair, or Bella Duclair, Gwen Harris wrote the district attorney about the charges against Danny Beauclair, which would be filed. And that has been, um, that's been part of the record. Uh, the advice from Gwen Harris to Mr. Beauclair continued as from the beginning. Um, Mr. Beauclair, cites in great detail that throughout the representation he was continually advised to say these things, go to these sex offender treatment people, you can enter the diversion treatment program, you can get favorable treatment. And of course, when it turned out that it was just a, uh, a construct, something that didn't really exist, but simply something she hoped would happen, he wasn't gonna get diversion. Now he's made all these admissions uh, pursuant to that advice, and now he's stuck with the position of, we're going to trial. So now she offers up, well, you continue to make these uh, admissions, take this plea, and I can get you probation. A, uh, a representation which is incredible under those circumstances. A level one offense prosecuted by Robert Hecht was not a snowball's chance that she, he was going to get any probation. And, but she persisted in taking that route. And, it, and then, he, uh, so he's demonstrated that he was prejudiced by this conflict. So we asked that uh, this court send this case to the trial court to hold a hearing to get at the specifics of that conflict and how it prejudiced him on the record so there can be a decision based upon all the facts available. Thank you. Do we have any further questions of counsel? Yeah, I have one sure. quick question. The, uh, I, I was just looking at the uh, uh, issues raised October 2003 on the motion to withdraw a plea. Uh, it doesn't mention uh, a conflict. When, not. when there were a number of motions of different flavor uh, filed by your client, when did the conflict issue first arise or first allege? It it, it arose from the first time he spoke to Gwen Harris. Not when it arose, when was it first asserted that he had conflicted counsel was a, as a claim for relief? I believe it was that filing I referred to earlier, June 4th, 2013. Okay. And, and not so much in, in those words, so, so but the dozen, actual facts. So that was a dozen years after uh, he pled. Four, 13 years. Okay. Uh, you're right. Closely, that number. Do we have any more questions? Thank you, Council. Thanks, Jeff. May it please the Court, the State Appearance by Assistant Solicitor General Natalie Chalmers. 
There is another procedural glitch in this case that hasn't been raised. Um, the Court of Appeals didn't reach the issue of whether or not this 1507 is successive. Nothing in the petition for review discusses whether or not this petition for review is successive. So I'm not sure this court, even if you were to go with the timely finding, which I'll get into why I don't think it's timely in a minute, I'm not sure whether or not this court can just remand it back to the district court. The court should consider the district court's opinion that this petition, or 1507, was successive. And here, everything that he is raising now has been known for a very long time. The conflict of interest was in existence when he pled, if it in fact exists. The supposed recantation of the victim was present back when he attempted to withdraw his plea in 2003. Putting aside the successive question, and mm -hmm. since we're in your review, we're not supposed to reach it anyway, um, which is what it goes to, right? Whether it's been raised before. I, um, let's go. But let's just go back to timeliness. And um, let me just ask you: Has the credibility of the actual innocence claim ever been heard by a court? The motion to withdraw plea that occurred in two thousand and three, and there was an appeal from that. He, the defense attorney there, didn't put the victim on the stand. He just did it by the affidavit. The district court said that's inadmissible hearsay, essentially. And then what the Court of Appeals said was that the recantation was viewed with utmost suspicion. So yes, it's, that has been decided. I don't think that he gets to keep relitigating his actual innocence over and over in order to do manifest injustice some the, 16 years after the plea. Maybe I misunderstood. I, I thought... Judge Dowd said, uh, I'm not going to consider the affidavit because it's hearsay. And uh, so and the Court of Appeals affirmed, but I don't see where any jurist has made a credibility determination, as my colleague is asking, as to the newly discovered evidence. Correct, because the victim was never put on the stand by defense counsel. Had that happened, that credibility determination would have been made. But the answer is no, there's never been a credibility determination because of procedural impediments, is what you're saying. A hearsay impediment. Yes, hearsay case. impediment. There has been the no witness judge. has never been on the stand. Right, the witness has never been on the stand. Nor have any of the other <clears throat> affiants that he's... Uh, submitted in support of his actual innocence claim. Correct. Okay. And is that sufficient? Is that sufficient to hear it? I mean, can, I think can courts say that the motions, files, and records foreclose relief without ever hearing from the witnesses that say he's innocent? I think at this point it's too little too late. If he had his chance because to his raise... Because his attorney messed up and didn't bring a live witness. Correct. And... Presumably, because we have to presume that that counsel was effective, there was a reason that live witness was not called. We have, I mean, this has been going on for years. He should. That's get... granted. <laughs> it's been going on for years, and there have been lots of pleadings and lots of uh, necessary time spent defending against those pleadings. Um, but that's the troubling thing here to me is he never really had his day in court to have that witness heard. And counsel, I have a question for you. Doesn't it seem like the state of Kansas would have some interest in making a determination as, as to whether or not a victim they relied on in bringing these charges, that victim is now recanting. Don't you think the state of Kansas would have some interest in talking to that person face to face to find out why they're recanting? It's possible the state of Kansas has. We just haven't called them as a witness or put them on the record because it's not our job to put on the defense's case on why a plea should be withdrawn. But it is your job to make sure that um, there's nothing false in the proceedings or to at least bring the truth forward. You're not there just to convict people. You're there to find justice. So wouldn't the state have justice compelling interest in bringing this person in and saying, why are you recanting at this point in time? And they haven't done that, right? And maybe that's sort of been something that has done years and years ago. But at this point, finality of the conviction also is important to us. We don't believe that So finality Mr. is more important than, than whether or not the victim told the truth or not? I believe the victim did tell the truth. Which and time? In the affidavit? Or when no, she was not in the, in the affidavit. Okay. And, and how, what do you, how does your belief factor in? Yeah. I well, mean, your belief that really may be irrelevant, but. Relevant. <laughs> no offense, but not relevant, right? Right. 
So you believe she told the truth based on the fact that... Based on his confession as well. He confessed... And his allegation is that confession was... He was misled into making that confession by a lawyer who was conflicted. And he is misrepresenting facts in making that. I believe, or at least his facts are changing. In his brief, he said that Della... Miss Harris was appointed as Della's attorney on May 6th of 1999. That is after he confessed to the police in this case, which is what the Court of Appeals found, is the confession occurred before Miss Harris was entered into this case and had any contact on the criminal charges. That's in the Court of Appeals opinion? That's in the Court of Appeals opinion. I know they rely on the confession. They, they date it to before Berger became involved? I, yes, I didn't bring the opinion here. But yes, I believe that is accurate. That was one of the reasons they found that the recantation was not credible here and wasn't sufficient to establish actual innocence. My problem is that there's no new evidence in this actual innocence claim. Typically, in the federal system, the way you do actual innocence is it has to be new evidence that makes it more likely than not no reasonable juror would have convicted the prisoner. Here, this evidence has existed since at least 2003 when he could have had a hearing and presented this and shown actually that the victim was innocent. He didn't and now he continues to make this claim over and over and he just shouldn't be permitted to do so. Isn't it, it isn't the new evidence new means post conviction? It doesn't mean or does it? I mean you're arguing it's it's not new because it's not new since the motion to withdraw plea. Right. If this had been the first time he raised it, it would have been the evidence. But the problem is, it's already been raised, it's been litigated more That doesn't less. mean that it's not new evidence, though. Because the, the, the newness of the evidence refers back to the conviction. That's why we ask whether a reasonable juror would convict, right? Right. Okay, so it is new evidence, then. It's new since, since he pled. It's, it's new since he pled. Okay. Yes, but it's not... I don't think... And if a it, reasonable juror had that new evidence, what makes you think... I mean, what would, be your, what would the state's argument be as to why that reasonable juror would still convict? The same argument that was accepted by the... Or the same... It's reasonable to think that a juror would still convict uh, Mr. Beauclair had the victim testified that it never happened. That's reasonable. Well, we have her original statements. Right. We have his repeated confessions. We have his confession that was made prior to this supposed coercion. Yeah, existed. assume all the evidence that the state would have relied on, and then assume that the jury also heard the new evidence. And I'm asking you, do you think it's reasonable? Do you think a reasonable juror would still convict? Yes. Okay. Would just disbelieve her recantation. The, a reasonable juror would re disbelieve her recantation. That's yes, your position. I also don't know that the recantation, if there was actual evidentiary hearing, would stand, but I see that I have to deal with that fact. Um, that's the that's the problem. Right. I mean, and, and that's what I was trying to get at with your opposing counsel. I, I admit I had very limited success, but what's the standard um, <clears throat> by which we should treat an affidavit from a victim recanting an accusation? And typically, there's... This court, I believe, and the Court of Appeals have said recantations are used with utmost suspicion. I understand that, but those are usually in cases where the recantation has actually been heard in court, right? Not when a I, judge has said, you've brought me an affidavit, that's hearsay, I'm not going to pay any attention yeah, to it. I'm not sure procedurally if it's always in court or if it's just the recantation affidavit itself. Okay. Um, the conflict of interest claim, meanwhile, it has been raised for the first time in the appeal in this case. It was not raised to the district court below, so I don't think we can fault the district court I'm for sorry, denying. Could you, could you just oh, repeat the beginning of that again? The conflict of interest Thank you. claim has been, was admittedly raised for the first time in the Court of Appeals in this case. I don't think we can fault the district court judge for not breaching this conflict of interest claim when it was not raised before. He doesn't that even court. get to the conflict of interest claim without the actual innocence getting him a procedure. That is also true. In. Yes. Yeah. But even if you find the actual innocence, I do think you have to figure out whether or not this is excessive, and which I think ties into my actual innocence claim in the fact that this could have been raised, this could have been litigated, it wasn't. We shouldn't let defendants repeatedly litigate things based on new evidence when it should have been litigated before. I would 
if this was the first time this was raised, I would probably agree that there was a viable actual innocence claim and there should be some kind of evidentiary hearing here. The problem is it's too late in time. For those reasons, we would ask you to affirm the Court of Appeals. Any more questions? Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. You preserve three minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Judge. Very briefly. The, in a pro se filing of June 4th, 2013, Mr. Beauclair set forth clearly that uh, before he spoke with the police on April 27, 1999, and gave this uh, confession that he consulted with Miss Harris and she had advised him, uh, say whatever you need to say, including giving a false confession in order to get, to take advantage of a diversion program and to get your children back in your home. I agree that the standard is the, I believe is the one articulated by Justice Stegall uh, and that's my rebuttal. Just so I'm clear on some of these dates and the arguments, at, did you say this was an April uh, 1999 conversation that your client had with Ms. Harris? Correct, prior to giving a confession to the police. And at that time, she was not his counsel, is that right? Right, she was appointed counsel for Della Beauclair in the child in need of care case. They were married, uh, he attended the meeting, the meetings that she had with Ms. Harris. And he received that advice from Ms. Harris during those meetings before he went to the police department and confessed. Okay. And then what we wrote in our decision in 2006 was that he was charged in November 1999 and that same month Ms. Harris was appointed as his defense counsel. Is that correct? Uh, that's probably what you wrote, but that was based on an affidavit she gave which was false. She wrote a letter to the district attorney, and I have it here, and it's part of this record, in uh, May 6th of 1999, saying, I represent him in this matter involving these allegations of sex abuse, and uh, he wants to enter the diversion program, and when you file the charges, get with me so I can help process him through and finish this process of getting him involved in the incest diversion program. It's just, a specific letter that's attached to the appellant's brief. Uh, that was June so, 1 of 2000, no, excuse me. May 6th, I think you said was the yeah, date. I said May 6th, I think I have it right here. May 6th, 1999? Correct. And what was the so, date of her appointment again as his criminal defense she, lawyer? He hired her less than a month later and we have the receipt as an attachment to our brief where he first paid 1,000 and then a year later paid an additional 1,250. And those receipts are appended to that brief. So she was not appointed by the court okay. in the criminal case. Okay. She had been working with him from the almost the day she was appointed to represent Della Beauclair in the child needed care case, April 19th of 1999. And what okay. date did he confess? I'm not clear on that. Well, he was suspected based upon the allegations that led to the Saint case of committing sex acts against a stepdaughter. Uh, that's My where he confessed. Is, when did he, the statement in the Court of Appeals opinion says, first, Beauclair had already confessed to the police before the lawyer began representing him. I want, I'm just am asking, when did he confess? April 26th, okay. 1999. Is it your position that she was representing him since from April 19th forward? On or about April 19th when she was appointed, received the sync petition, learned the facts, met with uh, Della or Bella and or Della and Danny Beauclair. I, I'm a little more confused now. Okay. You talked about when she was appointed, not for Mr. Beauclair, but in the sink case. In the sink case for the mother of the child. Um, Bella, Bo, Adela Beauclair. Adela, okay. So at, I don't know that I need the exact dates, but the sequence, right. there's, an, uh, there's an allegation made a sync proceeding has started. Uh, Della Beauclair is, has counsel appointed, and that's Ms. Harris. Correct. Ms. Harris then visits with uh, Della and Mr. Beauclair. Right. When, according to you, she tells him, we have this diversion program, incest diversion program, you're not going to go to prison. And then at 
some stage after that is when he confesses to the police? Correct. Okay. And then after that, you believe is when she was retained by Mr. Beauclair. Is that right? She, he gave, him, gave her cash on June 6th. Okay. Or but, before June 6th or thereabouts. And then on May 6th, 99, is when she wrote this letter. Correct. On his behalf, which you believe means that she was acting as his attorney. I believe in the criminal matter. I believe she was acting as his attorney when she consulted with him in her office between April 19th and before he gave the confession on April 26th. Whatever you want to call that, she's giving him legal advice. I say it's an attorney client relationship. When you start giving legal advice on an important level one felony, to a person who's going to be charged shortly. But formally, she was only representing the wife at that point. Right, formally. Pursuant well, to what does that mean, formally? She was appointed to represent the wife. Correct. Do we have any other evidence as to the relationship between Mr. Beauclair and the attorney in that key April 19th to 26th time frame? All of these facts are alleged by Mr. Beauclair, specifically in that filing I earlier represented. We'd also have uh, the wife's uh, statement. To You're just it. relying on the claim, as I understand it, that he's meeting with the attorney, she's, she's been appointed to represent his wife, but she's also giving him legal advice vis-a-vis -vis the criminal investigation. Right. Okay. These were the uh, allegations in his filing June 4th. 2013. And, and the first evidence of that relationship being created, besides his saying that in your interpretation of it, is the letter of May 6th that she sent on the criminal matter to the district attorney. Uh, yes, sir, and the receipt of the same day. Right. All right. All right. We have any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Judge. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement.